welcome to the JTM Community Podcast, where we are creating a community that you can bank on. I'm your host, Jason Melvin. Today, we will be discussing personal accountability, the topic that y'all had voted for for today. Of course, if you haven't had a chance to put in your vote for our next topic, go ahead and do so. You can find that at j-tm.community slash podcast. Today, we're joined again by our good friend, teacher, and husband, not our husband, but he is a husband, um, Will Squires. Uh, Again, today is going to be the topic of accountability, so we're going to kind of dive right in. Will, when you think of personal accountability, what do you think of? What does that mean to you? Oh, definitely trying to keep track of like boundaries within personal relationships, um, making sure that you're keeping on track of everything that you've committed yourself to, Hmm. um, personal accountability. Those are the, I'm just going to start with the two main things. And that's the two main things is making sure the boundaries and relationships are kept correctly. And then, you know, following up with everything that you've, um, set yourself to, to do, um, whether it be at your job or in relationships or, um, friends and acquaintances that you've just kind of, you're kind of working with alongside. So okay, kind of the, those partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. The partnerships. Okay. Can you speak on the boundary part of that first? Um, for the personal accountability piece is just the boundaries is understanding where people are. Um, and like you and I have been friends for a while And we still don't know absolutely everything about each other. Oh gosh! But the things, the things that, the things that we do know about each other, are the things that could um, cause us to kind of get frustrated at certain times or be happy at certain times. And so, when it comes to personal accountability for me, that means that I've always have to keep in um, in mind the things that I know about you, because I'm not going to go off and start talking about things that are going to like frustrate you in a bad way because it brings up bad or sad emotions from, from past experiences in your life. Mm. And so it's, it's in, in that terms, that's what I feel is it's a friend's job or a person's job. If you know something about someone, you don't use that. uh, I mean, as an advantage, which is um, kind of against like business one hundred and one. if you know somebody's weakness, you go after it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to being a real person, which is what I feel I kind of resort back to most of my life is just, I want to be a good person and I don't want to use that. I try not to use that stuff to, to get at people. So it's my job and I have to keep myself accountable that I'm like, Oh, I know this person has had a really traumatic experience with this. I'm not even going to start bringing that up and like use that against them or anything like that, because it could be something that could really harm the relationship. So really that idea of being accountable for the things that you're doing or saying or how you're approaching somebody yeah Um, and if if we're being honest at times we will cause that harm accidentally or unintentionally as well but what i really hear you saying is if you know these things then part of that personal accountability is trying to navigate that well again expecting that it's not going to be perfect and sometimes we'll make mistakes and a lot of times we do um but at this at the same time that's kind of our side of that and in that sense of personal accountability is to to navigate that the best we can it is and it kind of goes back to um just not just practicing what you preach but Mm -hmm. there's everybody's always watching and so you have to keep yourself accountable for everything you have to make sure that you know what you say and what you do match up because there's so many people that talk about these amazing things that they, they're like, Oh, I can do this. I can do this. I can go all over the place and do, but they don't back it up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or they, or they use certain things just to get what they want. And then they'll back off and never be seen or heard from again. And mm-hmm. it's, it's just kind of sad to see that. So. Yeah. It's kind of, using it to an advantage when it suits them or, or it's out of convenience, but yeah. um, not having that as a kind of a guiding force for their life. When I think yeah. of personal accountability, and, and I know a lot of folks will, uh, this will come to mind when, when they hear that, is largely being accountable for our own actions, our own behaviors. Yeah. Though 
the, the, idea, the idea of personal accountability goes well beyond that, but I think that will be a really good um, place for us to start along with what you had already spoken to in the sense of relationships and, and boundaries there. Oftentimes, the idea of being accountable for our own actions, especially in uh, our culture, which is more... I'm going to use the word sensitive, and I don't, I'm not implying weakness. I'm not implying uh, anything other than the the true meaning of that word is that Mm -hmm. we feel things more heavily than we may have in the past where things were, we were a little more calloused uh, perhaps in the past. And now we're, we're hypervigilant to to some aspects, Absolutely, which has also led us to avoid conflict and has led us to avoid discomfort or distress, which Very I think, so. yeah, which has a direct negative impact on holding ourselves accountable. Because if we're being just blatantly honest, that shit feels bad. When yeah, you mess absolutely. up, holding yourself accountable does not feel good. If you are messing up or a friend, a coworker, a colleague, a loved one, a stranger, um, oftentimes we will um, avoid that engagement with them because that doesn't feel pleasant. It yeah. also prevents the resolution to whatever the situation would be. Absolutely. And there's, there's so many people that um, when you talk about that sensitivity piece is that they they don't want to deal with the saying that they're wrong or they've done something that has caused that accountability to go down, um, mm-hmm. like you were just talking about. But as soon as somebody else makes a mistake, they're ready to jump on it and, mm-hmm. and jump on their backs and say, well, why didn't you get this done? Like you said, you were going to, or, you know, this, this wasn't correct. Why did you do that? If you're going to start calling people out, you need to look in the mirror first and be able to do that to yourself. Yep. Um, it's, what do you think it's, that it's, is? Why do you think that at least I can only speak for American culture in general yeah. is that we are so opt to shit on somebody else. We're so opt to point out their mistakes or what they're doing wrong without acknowledging our own in the process. And when we make them, we expect others to be graceful and gracious, to show empathy and understanding to what we have going on. But that doesn't always hold up in the other direction and and you know what that's a that's an absolute great question i have and i like i've said in past episodes i don't have an answer for it Mm -hmm. um because i don't have enough um, data or just reference material from anywhere across just other than my own my own uh, purview Mm -hmm. so it's it really comes down to what i to what i see personally and it's just that so many people want to be, um, if we're talking about parents and, and children, mm-hmm. um, there used to be this almost hierarchical or uh, hierarchy within the, within the family where it was, you know, parent, grandparents, parents, kids, and you listen to your parents, you listen to your grandparents. And now it's almost like the parents and the kids are on the same level because the parents don't want to hurt feelings mm-hmm. and culture doesn't want to hurt feelings of the little kids. And it's like, but you need to have them be responsible for their actions. And yes, kids have to learn through their action. And you don't have to be mean about them learning through their actions because a three-year-old might not know something is wrong compared to a six or seven or eight-year-old who hopefully had been, has been taught that some actions are wrong and, uh, and can make the proper choice to not do it. And if they do, then they can show remorse and go back and, and make amends with that person or whatever event that they did. But um, yeah. I, just, I just see, at least in my own um, personal mm-hmm. view, I see so many people not wanting to hurt the feelings of their children and, it's, and keep them accountable in that is just that we don't want to have them crying. We don't want to hurt their feelings participation trophies for for mm-hmm. decades now have been coming out well they 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 went oh and 17 but they still played hard okay good they played hard they lost send them home with nothing because that's mm-hmm. it's just part of the thing that's how you learn 
that's how you learn. And if you want to be better, then you're going to work harder. Yeah, um, that lesson can, can and should serve as a motivator to, for that to be more valuable. And, when, and it doesn't come around. When things are just given and not necessarily earned, it diminishes the value of that thing. And, and it doesn't even have to be a tangible thing like a, a trophy or a paycheck. No. Right? Yeah. It can be a relationship. It can yep. be uh, the, the premise of happiness. As you were saying that, it, it reminded me of something I used to say, um, not too uncommon when I was working at the college and helping to support students to provide some additional clarity is oftentimes people will see support and accountability or support and discipline. And mm -hmm. I don't mean discipline in the sense of punitive, I no. mean discipline in the sense of doing the actions that need to be done, yes. even though it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I would clarify uh, fairly often that accountability and support are not mutually exclusive. I can no. support you and still hold you accountable. I yeah. can I can help you learn the lesson and I can support you as you learn that, which is mm -hmm. very different than avoiding the growth, avoiding the discipline because of the discomfort, because it, it feels bad. Whether that is a student yeah. going into a panic attack and struggling because they're not prepared for an exam because they chose not to study. Exactly. That level and of anxiety is appropriate and you should be anxious. That anxiety is teaching you a lesson, which is, hey, if you don't want to have this feeling next exam, study, Pre study, be prepared. study and do, but yeah, do better. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I, that, um, and I'm jumping back to my, to, yeah, my to my educator side. Um, when I'm trying to explain certain things, when we're working through our social emotional learning classes that we do in school, Mm -hmm. um, I always tell my students, there's a difference between compassion and empathy. And it kind of goes back to what you're talking about. Um, compassion is pretty much give, you know, just going, okay, everything's okay. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Empathy comes back to, I understand where you're at in your life, but I still have to hold you to standards. And that's exactly, I have the empathy for you. I understand. I've gone through some of the same things, not everything, because I don't have the experience of, mm -hmm. I mean, I have 70 kids in my, on my team right now. I don't have the, the life events or experience of, a, of, of all 70 kids. Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, I have the experiences from mine and some of those line up with some of my students. So I have the empathy and I understand that they're going through something and I'm going to be there to work with them and work beside them. Mm -hmm. But if they make the choices that they don't want to, like you said, study for a test or turn their work on time or, um, or get a hold of me when something happens and lets me know. And then they don't. Um, and then they tell me at the last minute, instead of telling me when something happens and saying, Hey, this happened, I need, I might need some extra time. Perfect. Great. Thank you for telling me right now. But if you wait until the due date and then say, well, this happened, I'm not going to be able to help you. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to be able to step beside you and work with you. I'm going to have to, you know, be the authoritative person in the school and go, Nope, you were late. You lose 10, you know, you lose how many of her points, 10%, 10 points, whatever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. I still feel bad, sure, but I sure. still want, I still want to be there to support you. Mm -hmm. I still want to be there to work with you, but I have to hold you to the standards that I hold everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm trying to be mean. It's that I'm trying to keep that thought of your accountability. You have to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, then you're not going to, you're never going to learn. Along with that, as I had worked uh, at the college, both on my side, um, as well as engaging with faculty, two very similar stories. And that was, it, it wasn't uncommon and it became a lot more noticeable. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. gonna say frequent, um, especially through the pandemic, is that folks would go the full 16 weeks through a course, and not engage, some wouldn't engage at all. Um, right. And others would remarkably limited. And then at the end of that, they're wanting the faculty to provide them a grade um, for, for what was going on, but they didn't engage with them. So the faculty members and, and us may not have known anything. Yeah, right? we didn't um, and just, we know. 
would easily assume that that person essentially had just dropped the class or that, mm-hmm. or that, or that was their intent. And I, I can't tell you how many times where they would finally have contact at the end of the course, at the end of the 16 weeks, and we're wanting something magical to happen for them to, to still receive credit. And as much as that broke my heart because of the stories that I would hear for oh. that, um, the, the understanding of if, if, if that was happening, and I believe it to be so, reaching out at any point before would have created and allowed for so many more options versus mm-hmm. trying to retroactively try to deal with that. And I know yeah. that faculty would struggle with that because a lot of that pressure would land on them and then they would be would have some kind of inner conflict of, do they help them? Do they kind of break their own boundaries in an effort to, to do so? At yeah. the same time, it would foster mistrust uh, mm-hmm. because they would feel, faculty would often feel like students are lying or creating stories. Why didn't they ever reach out? At any point they could have, and I could have helped them, but yeah. they're trying to do this after the fact. And faculties often, especially as things pr- progress further, would say, I can't devalue the education by giving this person who doesn't and hadn't done the work a passing grade. Yeah. Because that devalues what all of the other people did. Because if, if you bust your ass and you earned a B or you bust your ass and you earned a C, but this person who didn't do anything for 16 weeks or hadn't done much of anything. And now I'm going to give them a passing grade, which, which now that becomes the value of a C yeah. uh, for them. And I, as much as I helped students to navigate the supports, I, I completely understand that the viewpoint from the faculty member. And again, it's, it's that acknowledgement that support and accountability are not mutually exclusive as much as they wanted to help that student. Yeah. That student was still accountable to either doing the work or making contact. And that's, that's where teachers come from. We want to, that's why we take these jobs, especially coming from the educator perspective is nobody gets in this because they want to be, you know, called stupid or, you know, have things thrown at them or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, have 400 parent emails that they have to answer every week or, you know, have to answer why somebody, you know, have to say, you know, this is why your child is failing. We don't get in it for that. We get in there to help students. We get in there to make sure that they understand that they're supported and to give them an education so that they can can become better people. Um, And at least from my perspective, you can't become a better person if you don't hold, if you're not held accountable for things. It's just, it's just really hard to, to do. I feel like you, somebody cannot learn the lesson if they can't acknowledge their own part of the situation, their own accountability, Mm -hmm. because until you do that, the mindset is that of a victim. This, Mm -hmm. this thing is happening to me and I have no response both in it happening or it resolving. They it's put on somebody else, which is a faulty way of thinking because the, the resolution, if it involves you, has to also come from you, at least within part. But oftentimes we, we dodge that because it feels gross. It feels stressful. Again, we're, we have oftentimes folks have that conflict avoidant um, mentality. Yeah. And that's kind of in, in part the culture we have created. I was uh, watching a gentleman, his name is uh, Jordan Peterson, who has really good input. If you check out uh, the TikTok, so I don't really post any TikTok videos mm-hmm. for this. There's there's a couple, but it more so is uh, for the podcast, just kind of getting info out there. Right. All the motivational, all the inspirational, all the human connection clips are like videos. And what you'll see, and it ranges everything because 
what one person needs today, somebody else needs something very different. So I trust mm -hmm. that people will find the thing they need to hear that particular day or, or the thing uh, that they need to see that particular day. You'll see him, uh, Jordan Pearson, often uh, popping up and he expresses uh, a few different things. And in part is that accountability, the accountability for ourselves. And he, there's a moment that he gets emotional because people have given him a rap for being uh, a little more aggressive or uh, engaging in conflict. And there's, there's a, a clip in there where he, he's emotional, he's tearful, mm -hmm. and he's struggling um, with that premise. And he says, he's explaining it and says that he hates conflict. He hates that engagement. But what he understands is that if if somebody has a problem with him and he doesn't engage with them to resolve okay. it, that just is it's delayed true. and causes further harm later. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you do the work now as uncomfortable, as hurtful as it may feel, knowing that if you don't, it's just going to be tenfold later yeah. on down the road. Yeah. Um, which I think was a beautiful understanding given some of his, his education. And, um, and I'll, I'll admit uh, also coming, emotions being exhibited by a male are a little more powerful, powerful for me because that's not something that we see often. Right. Um, and I think you would agree with that. The, just what our culture has often, and it's starting to shift, which is, which is definitely good, is mm -hmm. that those things aren't exhibited um, through as much, yeah. through males? Yep. Versus because I've been exposed to it coming from females much more mm -hmm. um, doesn't necessarily, and not that I'm dead inside or have no empathy. It's just what I've been exposed to, and what is socially acceptable is a uh, woman being more emotional has historically been more more acceptable. So acceptable, yeah, definitely. Um, hits a little different yeah i want to jump go ahead oh sorry sorry just real quick just based on that one that you were talking about i like i like the term i've heard the term i cannot remember who um coined it but um it was productive discourse mm, and like it's that. just it's just making sure that you i mean you're the discourse is always going to be feeling a little strange and a little mm -hmm. awkward but you have to go through that um and it goes back to a, to some of the mindset and growth mindset stuff that Carol Dweck did at Stanford, I believe it was where she did it. Um, you don't learn something and you don't make yourself better if you don't challenge yourself. And challenging yourself through that through that discourse between two people, whether it be you know what we were talking about from our situations, um, or just going up and talking to somebody in a different way and making yourself uncomfortable a little bit. Mm -hmm. you're, you're never going to have that. Like if you always go, go the easy route, you're never going to have start building those, um, structures within yourself mm -hmm. to, to be a better person and a harder worker and more, um, capable of surviving on your own without this, without the support of people. We all mm -hmm. need somebody. We all need a person, a social structure to help us. But the way that some of these people are growing up with just always go in the easy direction they they're always going to need people to support them and won't be able to do anything on their own um i think a good it, metaphor yeah. to uh what you're saying as well and correct me if i'm missing the mark a little bit is that of getting physical growth so if you're trying to put on um, muscle mass for example okay. is if you continue to do exercises or use weights that don't challenge your body, that mm -hmm. it doesn't fatigue your body, that it doesn't in, in some way cause uh, discomfort in your body, you won't, you won't get the gains, right? You have yeah. to do the difficult things. So whether that is using a lower weight, but doing more reps and you, so your, your muscles are strained, right? Yeah. They're, they're truly and literally under tension is where the, the growth is done mm -hmm. and equating that to kind of life, life choices, uh, it's, it's the same. If you continue to go the easy route that has no resistance, mm -hmm. you, you can't get the growth. No, you will, you you will always be where you're at if you're not doing the things that personally challenge yourself, whether that is 
in a career, whether that is in your health or relationships, it could be any aspect of life. And if you're, if you're making the easy decisions to go the easy route, you're going to have a, a similar outcome. But if you're making the hard decisions and going the more difficult routes, that's where the growth is, is done. Yeah. And it, it doesn't always have to be the hard or the easy choice. It doesn't always have to be the hard choice and it doesn't always have to be the easy choice. But mm-hmm. like, like we said in the last one, mm-hmm. in the last podcast, moderation, you know, you have to challenge yourself at times and mm-hmm. break some of those, some of those borders that you have and kind of go, okay, now I need to stretch myself a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and just make sure that you keep doing that because that's, that's how you're going to be a grown, be a better person. So I love it. The, if you're cool with it, I want to jump to a different avenue. So we talked largely about kind of the behavioral aspects, the kind of taking the actions, you applied it to your place of business, if you will. Yeah. Um, I want to transition it a, a little more to relationships. Oh, okay. <laughs> And I'll use myself as an example. Oh, no, you, you um, can, you, like I said, go for it. Go at it. The, the first thing that, that I'll, I'll point out is uh, working in private practice. Uh, I enjoy working with, with anyone, mm-hmm. anyone and everyone, whether regardless of the setting, the culture uh, is something that I enjoy. The thing that I am most pulled towards is working with couples. Okay. And it has so many benefits and aspects to it. And what I've seen is various pitfalls. One of the big ones being that level of personal accountability. So Mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, folks tend to come in after the fact. So things are starting to break down already. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're looking for a lifeline and they're uh, Mm -hmm. at a, their divorce being finalized tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Um, and now they're now they're coming in. So for anyone who is listening, if you want to engage in counseling, any time is better than no time. Absolutely. It's never but, it's never bad to talk to anybody. It's never yes. bad to talk to somebody. That's yep. and that and like we talked about a little bit ago, that's one thing that I had to learn myself is there's never a bad time to talk to somebody. Yep. Um, but yeah, and, no, please go. Sorry about that. That's I just that was a I that's a wonderful that, point. Man. The And the thing that I really want to point out is the more proactive that folks engage in support, and it doesn't have to be a counselor, right? So regardless of what somebody's uh, struggling with, the sooner you engage in support, not only can you prevent some of the damage as you're not coming from the deficit of having to repair all of the damage that was done and then work on what the situation would be, but bringing it back to... uh, couples is oftentimes you'll have one partner who has a higher level of personal accountability than the other, which creates conflict because they're trying to do the work, but the other person can't see their part and and how they got there and and what they have going on, which leads to um, limited progress or a struggle until that knowledge can be uh, established. And if I use myself and, and Tracy as an example, and oftentimes through um, our, our throughout our relationship, there will be moments, and we all have days, right, where yeah, you're every, just, yeah. you wake up in a bad mood, something happens at work, something is happening um, in life. And given the last couple of years, we've all had a lot of shit. Uh, hitting us, which can uh, yeah. stretch us out more, cause more tension, anxiety, stress, whatever you want to add to that. Her and I have always had an approach and it, it ebb and flows, of course, but I try to always acknowledge if I'm in some kind of mood. And even if I don't know why, if mm-hmm. I feel it, if I, if I can sense that that's a thing, I don't allow it to be a choice. I don't, in my head, I don't say, this is just something that I have to deal with. There's no reason for her to know. There is a reason for her to know. And that's if I, at any point, be an ass, I'm telling you now, I'm in some kind of funky mood. If I know why, of course, I'll express why. But if I don't know why, but I can feel it, I always let her know. Because one, she doesn't deserve me to be anything but excellent and grateful Mm -hmm. to her. And I don't deserve to have the guilt of doing something hurtful to somebody I care about. Absolutely. By just putting it out there that those things are happening, it allows us 
to one, prevent it from happening. And if it does, it's already spoken on so we can talk about it easily. Yeah. Right. Um, but having that level and of course that, that takes trust to be able to do that. But when it comes to accountability, personal accountability, specifically in relationships, and it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, but uh, relationships in general, what comes to mind? Uh, well, like I said, going back to the knowledge of what people have gone through in their lives, mm -hmm. that's the first thing that jumps into my mind. So um, with, uh, with my wife and I, I know things that she's been through in her life that I don't um, I want to support her through if those feelings come up mm -hmm. and I don't want to poke at them. You know, if, if I'm in a bad mood or if I, or if I'm trying to, if I'm frustrated with her and I'm trying to find a way, I don't start making pointed comments towards in mm -hmm. that direction of that. So I have to be super, super aware of number one, how I'm feeling, mm -hmm. how she's feeling. And then, you know, things that I want to stay away from because I don't want to, I don't want to take her back into a bad place that she might have been in, in her life. Mm -hmm. um, and not into the super bad places in her life for that, but at the beginning of our relationship, um, we're both athletes. So when we first got married, um, she moved over from California to be with me and, because I already had... Uh, I was already two years into my teaching job mm. um, over here. So I didn't want to start just moving around and losing that time that I'd built up. Sure. And because we were both um, athletes, I was like, oh, fine. You know, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to go out and play sports. I'm going to go play on my sports teams. Like I have for the last two years, because I've been in this rotation of like, I would play softball three nights a week. I'd play soccer one night. And then I played basketball for two weeks or for two days. Um, so I was pretty much playing a sport every day type yeah. of sport almost every day mm -hmm. um and when she moved in I didn't change that mm. I didn't change that um that part of me because I was just on my I was just a, mm -hmm. in the groove um and so it came down to a head where it was just you know she I walk in one day I'm about ready to leave for a basketball like I, I come home from work drop off my stuff, say, Hey, I'm heading to the basketball game. Do you want to come with me? Um, and all of a sudden it just came to a head and just, she started breaking down. Um, and we, it, I had to call my team, say, Hey, I'm not going to make it tonight. And we had to spend the better part of three hours um, talking it over and just, mm -hmm. she had to remind me because she's very, um, she's very, an, very much of an internal thinker. She doesn't think out loud like I do a lot of the times, <laughs> um, which can be good at times and super bad at times, just like my talking out loud can be super bad at times. Um, but she had never told me that it was frustrating her. Mm -hmm. So I had never seen a problem with it until it built up in her. Yeah. And, and it, it, it took that time to, to go, Oh crap. I totally forgot that, you know, this isn't like when we were dating and I could just come back over here and I'm by myself. Yep. You're here every day now. The um, so I got to shift it, but the behavior didn't, the behavior didn't. And I, mm -hmm. and I didn't, I wasn't accountable for that because I didn't know that it was, there was, there was no communication in it. We, we hadn't talked mm -hmm. about it because it didn't seem like a big deal to her. Yep. She would come and cheer and she would come and watch, um, but she wasn't playing. And it just kind of, she took it more as like, me trying to get out of the house. Like, and I was like, no, this is just what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, but once I knew about it, then I had to keep myself accountable after the fact. So from there on, it's been cut down from seven days or six days, depending on what it was to, mm -hmm. you know, I have to talk to her um, and say, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about joining another team. Would you be okay with that? And luckily we've both been able to have, um, some co-ed teams that we can play on so we can do the activity together. And that's been really good. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been case, moments but... where she's been able to indulge and engage mm -hmm. when you couldn't. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's one of the, one of the things is just that not only the converse, the conversation, mm -hmm. but just the accountability of saying, I can't say yes to everything that I want to do anymore because I have that other person I have to check in with. Yeah. Um, and it's not that she's saying, yes, I can, or no, I can't but 
it's a that relationship is important to me. And so yeah. I want to make time for her. And I, I wasn't used to being in, in that at the time. So it's kind of twofold. It so it's, yeah. it was personal accountability on her to speak up when, once she started feeling a certain way and didn't or much earlier than point. the blow up. Yeah. Yep. And then it was personal accountability on you to address the expectations that you had, which it sounded like, sounded like expectations that you didn't really give any additional thought to, but once oh. you did, now you put that personal accountability on yourself to make sure as you're navigating that, that mm-hmm. she's incorporated, uh, to some degree, whether it is kind of walking through as far as how would that impact your life or if she wants to go and engage. And again, uh, the two of you finding co-ed um, sports that you can play as well at times. Yeah. And it goes, because it, it goes awesome. back to the, it goes back to the money situation too. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, do we want to be spending all this money on stuff just for me? Or are we going to try and save and do other stuff that we want to, if we decide to move or buy a car, you know, it all changes, especially when you get in, get into that, um, that, that paper marriage relationship. Um, not just the, I mean, a lot of people have those great relationships where they're, they're not married. They just have that, mm-hmm. that connection and they don't need that piece of paper, which is nice. Um, her and I are a little bit more traditional and we, sure we, we wanted that. Yeah. Um, but it was some, it took some time to get used to cause we'd never been in that situation. So it is new for both of you. Yeah. Absolutely. The, I think that is a beautiful example of personal accountability from uh, actually several different angles. And I appreciate you being willing to kind of share that story. When it comes to our emotions and feelings in regard to personal accountability, what comes to mind? Oof. Uh, I haven't thought of that as much it's Mm -hmm. it's tough for me because um like i've said in the the past couple podcasts is that uh when i was younger um yes i was raised by my my mother mostly um mostly on my choice because i i just felt more comfortable um around my my mother and my my mother's side of the family um can you share a little bit more about uh your upbringing if you're comfortable no pressure bud yeah no um i my parents were married about a year and a half before I was born. Um, and then I was born a 85. Um, so you have a geriatric millennial talking to you right now, <laughs> Get out um, of here. <laughs> but, uh, no, they, my parents ended up getting, a, getting divorced when I was around four years old. Um, and then just over the years, it was back and forth with custody thoughts and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, just I felt much more comfortable with my at my mother's house with my mother's support system around because she had my grandmother and grandfather uh, right next door. So they were able to help with getting me to school. They were able to help with getting me to sports. They were able to help with um, just keeping me in an all around healthier um, mental state from what I from what I felt. Mm-hmm. And this is me talking from you know, my 2020 vision looking back, um, I couldn't have told you this when I was four or six or seven, but oh, sure, yeah. it, it just, it just felt a lot more comfortable. I wanted to be at, with this side of the family more. Um, mm-hmm. whenever I hung out with my father, it was, um, it was because those were the days he was supposed to get me. And then most mm-hmm. of the time I would be like, I would be home for 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour before he got home from work because he was a teacher as well, but at a different school. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just didn't enjoy that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I ended up, I ended up asking for just, you know, Hey, I just want to be where I want to be and make my own choices, which was I'll come hang out with you when, you know, if, if I feel like it, and I feel bad for that because it kind of took a lot of that time that most young men get with their fathers if they have, mm-hmm. if they have that support. Um, but yeah, it was just, I, I felt way com- more comfortable here. And uh, do you remember uh, on my mother's side when so. you made that decision? Do you remember how old you were at the time? Uh, I, I tried to, I tried not to just make that a rush decision Mm -hmm. Um, but it was, 
it was really early on. Like I just would get really uncomfortable and for no, for no fault of my father. Um, it was no fault of his that I would get uncomfortable when I was over at his house. It was just that I was used to, um, to that, like, that's, like I said, that support system that I had in my, right next to my mother's house when we were, when I was younger. So, um, that's kind of the, the comfort circle that you had been raised in. So that's what yeah. felt good and familiar. Yeah. And, and so it was, that was pretty much right from the beginning. So from probably the age of six, okay. um, that's when I was really kind of doing that, but I had to be the one that said, no, I, this is what I want. And, you know, I would try to, I would try to go over there and I would try to make that, that happen. Um, cause I wanted my father to, to be happy with me and to, to be proud of me. But like I said, it just, it didn't feel, feel right. So I would spend more, I would just say, you know, Hey, can I go, go back to my parents, to my mom's house? Um, and you know, begrudgingly because he wanted to spend time with me as well. He would, he would acquiesce and just say, okay, yeah, let's we'll get you back over there. Um, and I've never been able to really like, I know it hurt him. Um, but it was just something that, that I needed. And, you know, it's, he was, he was super, I mean, he was supportive of it, even though if he, if he wasn't happy with it. So. Yeah. That if I put myself in his shoes would be, uh, that, that would be hard to, to navigate and wanting to support and, value and acknowledge what your child is saying and wanting them to to feel comfortable and in a place where they feel truly supported Mm -hmm. at the same time the the pain that would have to come with the understanding of knowing that that's not me yeah yeah absolutely yeah and it it was it was just a it was just a tough it was just a tough time but Mm -hmm. I mean I had to I had to because of my parents because of my parents getting divorced when, when I was so young, I had to, to grow up very quickly. Yeah. Um, never something that I would want somebody to have to go through um, mm-hmm. on a personal side. So our, our stories are strangely familiar and I might have uh, some of the minor, the minor details wrong. And hopefully at some point in the near future, I'll actually have my older sister, uh, Tasha come and, join me uh, through one of the podcasts because she can speak to a lot of it and we're very similar in ways but also remarkably different uh, in Mm -hmm. ways but when I was born from not recollection but stories that I've heard of course I was way too young hence I was just born so I have no memory of of what that entailed but I believe uh, my mom had been pregnant and they either split just before or just after uh, I was born when my mom passed away uh, within these last few years and we were at uh, the ceremony funeral and showing uh, there were photos that throughout her life and I I do recall seeing one um, where he was in the picture Mm -hmm. and me and my sister uh, had conversation after the fact as we looked through the photos you can see a moment moments in time where my mom was happy and it looked like she had joy and a light in her life and then you could the photos that followed that you could tangibly visibly see that that was gone Um, how what happened I don't know, and um, not getting into a ton of those details um, for today, but to to bring that back to those that aspect of emotions and our feelings in terms of personal accountability, um, I think becomes remarkably important. More so because our actions are often dictated by the way we think, by the way we yeah. feel, um, and providing this story to, to bring up my sister, uh, knowing that our dad for for the, for the most part had been, um, absent, um, family dynamics. Uh, my mom had married his brother at one point. So my, my biological dad served as, um, more of a distant uncle over the years. Um, I had 
excellent grandparents and uncles in my life who really raised me and taught me uh, what it is to be a good person, to, to be a good man. And I also had uh, a lot of examples of what that isn't. Um, and fortunately, I was able to understand that to the point where I never, I can't recall uh, having a longing for that kind of figure. Yeah. But if I use my uh, older sister, and I apologize to her, uh, if she feels like I'm throwing her under the bus, she won't give a shit um, <laughs> at, at all. Um, but to acknowledge, I never had that longing where I know that that had a, a bit of a different impact for her. And we're, we're we are really close and yeah. have been um, for for quite a long time. But that that same impact had uh, two very different results uh, for for myself and for her. And for whatever reason, at an early age, I had the understanding of no one was going to provide me happiness or provide me joy. And nothing that I'm saying is implying ease or simplicity, yeah. uh, though, as I talk about it now, it, it might appear to be that. But there were um, dark days, very dark days, if, if I'm being honest, but the lessons were learned through that, through that struggle, through uh, that discourse and conflicts. I learned a lot. I grew a lot. Um, and there were, were very pivotal moments that I have. But one of those lessons was no one is going to provide me the happiness or the joy or the comfort that that was my own responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do that yourself. You know, and taking that lesson, which I had never forgotten, um, some days it, it hits harder than others, mm -hmm. but is the, the way I approach life and, and the things that, that I carry with me. And if I apply that to relationships, um, and I, I hope that you have a sense of what I'm, what I'm up, what I am about to say is that those that are important to me, those who have made me better over the last few years, I have been more intentional to invest in them. So whether it's has been reaching out to you and, and friends uh, who may be listening, will it'll become very apparent um, wh what I'm saying is whether that is my sense of pride for that person, of their accomplishments, of their growth, of things that they have struggled with but are getting help, uh, the struggles that have happened and they're reaching out or trying to take care of themselves or simply just acknowledging that they're struggling um, and have allowed me to, to be a part of that and have some value there. I can express the, the appreciation and gratitude and that these people, yourself included, um, have had a remarkable impact. And oftentimes, and Tracy and I have had this conversation and um, she's been, been doing much better as well in that same avenue is in the past, I would think about somebody, but I would never act on it. And in about 20 minutes, I forgot. Yeah. Now, if that happens, what is the 30 seconds that it takes for me to pick up my phone or tell Siri that I want to text that person, <laughs> right? And right. sometimes it's just, hey, thinking of you, I hope you're having an awesome day. Yeah. And I've gotten many, I've gotten many of those texts from you, which I appreciate. And I, I have to come from the other side of it and say, I'm, I still struggle with that, um, especially when it comes to that, because I had to grow up so quickly on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I've always felt, but I don't know if I've expressed to a lot of other people is that nobody can make you happy except for yourself, which I've just, mm -hmm. I said it earlier, but um, so I know that people go through things and I'm always willing to jump out and help and do that stuff. But when it's, doing a quick check-in if I know people are doing okay I trust that they're going to tell me if they need something mm -hmm. um and I do the same thing I I do the same thing that you used to do I I think about you guys I think about my friends I think about my family and for the most part I'll just go okay well I'm busy they're busy I don't want to bug them they're last time I heard they were doing well <clears throat> you know I, I'm gonna leave it at that um and if they need me or if they need to tell me something they'll let me know Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've been 
awful at. <laughs> I'm going to be a and, giant pain in your ass. No, go for it. Because you just said if they need me or want to have contact with you, they would let you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the mindset you're operating out of. They're probably having the, in the same thought. And I know you well enough. You would not let somebody know if you needed something. Sure. I shouldn't say that. Well, you would and rarely let and somebody that's, know. And, and that's why I get into those times of, that's why, that's why I know I'm horrible at doing this part of the accountability. Cause we can talk mm-hmm. about how awesome we are in accountability in other parts, but I will say right now, I'm awful in this because you know, I look at it and go, okay, how would I do it? Mm-hmm. And I never think, I never think about it in the terms of how the other people do it because, you know, we've all got things going on. We've all got crap going. And it's just, yep. I, I don't like being that, that person that's always going, you know, I don't like being that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's amazing. But, so, but, some, but sometimes people need, sometimes people need you just to say hi, like you, like you're the text that you'll send me just saying, Hey, I found this cool video for your students. I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. He didn't have to do that. That came from um, Tracy, by the way. So I don't want to take credit just in case she's listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so for her as well, that's awesome. That, that was fantastic. And uh, I've got, like, hey, send this to Will. Yeah. And I, I, ha- I have it and I've, I've looked at it a little bit, but I haven't been able to look at the whole thing. So I, I haven't shared it with my students yet, but um, I'm hoping to, as soon as I find a place to fit it into the class. So uh, the, yeah, I think I'm it's horrible awesome. at it. In the conversation that we're having on, on personal accountability, watching you actually make yourself accountable is, is awesome. Like I, you can see the smile on my face. I can't hide it. It gives me joy <laughs> to see you in that process to be like, fuck, yeah, I could do a little bit better there. I can't. And it, but isn't, isn't that what this is about? It's, yep. it's about understanding that. And honestly, I know, I know that because I have a ton of people that's, that are like, well, why, why haven't you texted me? Because I, we're all busy and I mm-hmm. don't want to be that pain in your ass. Oh, but I wanted to hear from you. How do I know if you wanted to hear from me? Mm-hmm. And that's <laughs> where it's twofold. Because it's yeah. their it's their personal accountability as well. It's a two to, to road. <laughs> yes, you're like two ships passing in the night, right? Mm-hmm. You're both having the same thoughts and ideas, but you never see the other person. Yeah, and, and and it's it's it is very it's very. I've gotten a lot better at calling myself out on stuff like this, mm-hmm. um, but I and I know I'm horrible at it. I I need to get better at it. Um, now I just have to. I would to agree with it. you. I would absolutely agree with you. You are horrible at it. <laughs> I, what I mean by that is I, I agree in the sense that that was an acknowledgement that I had, again, over the last few years and the level of intentionality now to do those things, where now if I, if I have that sensation or I think of that of a person or a situation or whatever, I chalk it up to I'm supposed to. So then I, then I reach out. Um, And sometimes I hear back from folks and and sometimes I don't. But what I can tell you for sure, since I've been doing that, is I feel love more profoundly than I have ever felt it before. And and that's one of the things that I was wondering about, especially because you brought it up, is that, and and I know know for you, because I know you personally, that it's not just for making you feel better. Oh God, no. But I'm, but I'm wondering how many people do that just to make themselves feel better. Mm-hmm. And then they go, okay, people are thinking of me too. Now I've done something good for the day. That's, that's one of the things that I don't like. I always think of it like that. Yeah. And I go, well, if I feel like it's just going to make me happy. I mean, I know it, it might make them happy or it might, or they might go, you know, blank, go blank yourself. I didn't want to talk to you. Today. <laughs> um, but what you know is it am I doing it just for me Mm -hmm. or am I doing it because I'm trying to strengthen that connection and if I'm and now that I'm actually thinking if I'm trying to strengthen that connection it's going to be more continuous and more on the levels of just you know not just saying hi once or twice but Mm -hmm. you know the back and forth of you know hey I heard you were going golfing today how did how'd your golf game go you know oh cool all right I'll talk to you later just those little, little mini conversations but um I just wonder how many people are going to listen to us and start going, Oh, that's a great idea. And then just do it because, Oh, I feel so special that people are texting back now. And it's like, Oh no, that's not what it meant. That's not what it's meant to be. <laughs> yep. Uh, that can be a beautiful byproduct of engaging, mm-hmm. which still serves 
the purpose. So yes. by being personally accountable, even if you do the right thing for the wrong reason, you still did the right thing. And over time, that yeah. begins to strengthen and course correct itself. So I'm, I'm pretty known for uh, engaging or bringing things into coworkers, for example. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be uncommon that I'd buy donuts or cookies or uh, goodies, the occasional yep. uh, fifth of whiskey, whatever it would be, right? Um, it, 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 for my for my mother and I, when we were teaching together, it was we would do coffee every other Friday for all of, all the teachers in our hallway. Yep. Um, when we were, it awesome. was it was just a normal thing that we would do every you know every other Friday. So. And, and what you'll notice, and what I'm sure you did notice from that, is even it, and it would be oftentimes that I would just be dropping them off. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't see the joy that would that it would cause, but that wasn't my intent. Right. Mind you, it does feel good to do those things. It does. Right. But the intent was that I knew that a cookie, a donut, right, uh, a simple greeting, a hello, reaching out in a text, that that can have a profound impact on people that I care about. Yeah. And when I'm able, why would I not do that? But before, the, the reason was exactly what you said is that we're all so busy. We don't have the time to do that. And we put it, we put the requirement on everyone else that well, if they need yeah. something, they'll reach out. It, beca it, it becomes a, it becomes a, it becomes a, I have all these responsibilities yep. with work, with, with, you know, if you have children with children, oh, gosh, yeah. um, with a spouse or a, or a significant other, you have those relationships. And then um, sadly to say the friendships other than, um, you know, the ones that are like, you're always seeing every single day, mm -hmm. they just kind of go, okay, well, we know we're there for each other if we need it, but <laughs> everybody's mm -hmm. so damn busy. Um, and so you kind of get into that account, like when you talk about accountability, I'm accountable for this, 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 oh, and I have to be accountable for my friends as well. Mm -hmm. Crap. Yep. And it can feel, it can become overwhelming. Mm -hmm when it feels like these are things that I have to do. Yeah. But when you can acknowledge the way you're viewing that and how that's being perceived and come to an understanding that those are things you want to do mm -hmm. because you, you choose to be a teacher, you choose to be a husband, mm -hmm. you choose to be a friend, you choose to be a son, right? Like there, there are, and that's a, that's a spectrum. Yeah, right. Absolutely. You could tell your mom, "Fuck off, peace out." And but you choose but yeah, not because <laughs> she she has been listening to these. So right now I'm saying this. That is a no. I would. Uh, I may or may not flip her off at a turn light once in a while, but that is about it. And that's because she started it. Just saying. Okay. I could never imagine that happening. Your mom's. She's pretty awesome. Oh no, I have a. I'll have a story for you later if we ever do. If we ever do other <laughs> stuff, I have a story for you. The, the first time she ever flipped me off, and I just kind of went, seriously? Okay. Nice. But... The when we can have that understanding of we're in the positions that we are in large part because of the choices we choose to make. Yeah. Then, the it shifts from these are things I have to do. Or responsibilities that I have to things mm -hmm. that I'm choosing. And if you yeah. choose, it, it, it shows a level of want, regardless of the motivators for it, right? And it, yeah, and, and there's, a, there's a whole bunch of things that I've gone through in my life and started to catch you up again, but there's a whole bunch of things mm -hmm. that have gone on in my life that I, like, like we're talking about, mm -hmm. it's the follow through. When we're younger and we don't know any better, it, it's tough to, to follow through properly, pro properly until we know what we did wrong. And that's where you need that person, that older person, that more experienced person to step up and say, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. So you did the wrong thing this time, fix it and make sure you don't do it again. Yep. Um, and that's what, that's what I've been trying to do with myself because did I make mistakes when I was in my teens? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have I learned from it? Yes. Do I never want to, do I want to make sure that I never do those actions or things again? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's because somebody pointed it out to me or I felt this sense of regret and, you know, um, unworthiness that I shouldn't have been able to, that, that I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. 
so it's caused it's caused that need to change and be a better person um and that's yeah there's there's a whole bunch of stories that we could go through through with that things that i've learned from with accountability but oof. i am going to use what you just said as a springboard uh because i also wanted to touch on success and failures which you just dabbled in yeah the we often like to take credit for our own successes mm-hmm. but we tend to blame when it comes to failure yeah. One, we were remarkably, and when I say we, I'm saying f- folks uh, at large based on my own personal experience and mm-hmm. um, not just anecdotal, but uh, some research search as well, is that people tend to be failure avoidant mm-hmm. um, without acknowledging that there's these two, um, there's discrepancies, but they're also very similar because most people aren't successful the first time they attempt to do a thing, right? right? So the whole point of education is failure, right? Right, absolutely. You You can't learn something unless you fail it, yeah. Yep, you learn this You have to fail at it first. Exactly, but somehow we learn, we have forgotten a lesson and we expect both from others and and from ourselves is to nail it the very first time we do a thing. And you can't get better at something if you don't fail, but we're so failure avoidant Mm -hmm. that oftentimes that will push somebody into inaction. They won't even make the attempt. They won't do the thing because their, their fear, fear of failure provides and destroys even the opportunity for success. Yes. And like I said earlier, um, Carol Dweck has done a whole bunch of um, studies on, and I use this for my students as well, but growth mindset. And it's the thought process of telling yourself that you can't do it yet. Mm-hmm. And it continue continually saying, you know, I might not be good at it right now, but if I continue to challenge myself and change, change the way that I go at it, because you don't want to be the definition of insanity and do the same thing, you know, like repeat the same test over and over and over thinking you're going to get different results without yep. changing something. Yep. Um, and she, she does a whole bunch, she did a whole bunch of work with middle school students, um, having one group, having people come around and saying, oh, you're really, you must be really good at this. You're, you you look, you look like you're doing really well. You must be very smart. Um, where the other ones were getting different feedback and saying, oh, you look like you're trying really hard at this. You're putting all your effort into it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so the students that got the growth mindset talk, the, the people that were not just saying, oh, you, you're very smart because we're not born innately smart. Um, it's all b- about the hard work and what you do. Um, they, they started to see this gap between the people that were told that they were smart. They would stay here with all the easy stuff and mm-hmm. the people that would get that extra growth mindset talk in their ear you know, they would start building themselves up and start going for the more challenging um, activities, the most challenging tests, the most challenging um, brain teasers, they would go after that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's one of the biggest things is that everybody, because of where our society is right now, everybody expects, oh, I can just come into it and get an A right off the bat. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell my kids this. And I know I, I go back to my teacher lens all the time, because that's, a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have to tell my kids every single solitary day, five days a week for 180 days out of the year, we're not perfect. And I put myself in there as well. Oh gosh. We are, we are not perfect. You and I are not perfect because of the fact that we are still learning every single day. We're going to be learning up until the day we, we leave this earth, Mm -hmm. but you can't expect to be a sixth grade student coming in and being able to write a perfect essay unless you've practiced and learned beforehand. And where would you have done that? Unless your parents are ahead of the game, unless you have um, family who knows how to do this and have shown you how to do this. Sure. If you're coming in at the base level, then yeah, you're going to be struggling, Mm -hmm. but that's why we're here to do it. It's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. But when I get to the end of what, what I'm trying to teach you, you should have been practicing that whole time to make yourself better and not perfect, but at least a sixth grade worthy essay. Um, And they just, 
a lot of these people that come in, a lot of these students that come in, they just don't get it because they've always been told, oh, you're perfect. You can do anything you want as long as you say you want it. You have to work for it too. I'm sorry. Yeah, that that can be a, rem- a, rem- a remarkably hurtful message to, to get for yeah. sure. The That idea of expectations and work, uh, not to, to bring it back to, to fitness, but that mm-hmm. idea of it is because we're so prone to avoid failure, if yeah. I use it to, um, again, to, to health and fitness, somebody comes in and they have this idea that they want to be able to bench press 300 pounds, right? Um, but they haven't worked out yet. They're, they're, uh, they're just starting their, their journey there. So they load it up, they get a spotter, and they begin begin to uh, drop the bar down. Can't move the muscle, nope. right? N- not even an inch. And in that moment, that person will have one of two thoughts. They're either going to acknowledge the work they need to do mm-hmm. to meet that goal, or to equate it to what we're talking about, they're going to have a sense of failure and throw the goal out right away. Well, um, it's, yeah. this, I, I failed. It's not worth it. I can't do it. That, that's why most people within the first seven to 10 days of New Year's resolutions mm-hmm. have already failed them because they come in with these overly inflated expectations mm-hmm. um, and they don't keep, they don't have somebody to keep them accountable. Um, our, our, our buddy Garrett, um, he like whenever we're at the gym together he's always the one keeping me accountable and i'm keeping him accountable we'll text each other you know how we've done it when we're working out and what we've done and what our reps were and how much weight we've done um just to kind of say hey this is where we're at and then when we get together and work out together you know we have that expectation Mm -hmm. i've never seen somebody and i love your i love your um your scenario but I've, i've never seen somebody come in and go you know, 120 soaking wet and go, I want to bench press 300 pounds. <laughs> and then they put all the weight on there and they're like, yeah, let's do this. I've, I've never, I would love to see that, mm-hmm. but you know, it is, that's exactly what people do. And that's how, that's how people come into life. That's how students come into my classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I hate saying that I have to do this, but I have to break their, their thoughts on that. And because there's no way that you can come in and expect to be perfect So yeah, you're going to get some lower grades. You're going to struggle. And if you don't struggle, then I'm not doing my job. Sure. So if if you're, if you're just happy as a clam and you're doing everything perfect and you don't, there's not a day that you don't hate me once in a while, then I'm not doing my job. I love that. The, that really kind of kicks up a thought for me. And that is people should oftentimes have two expectations. One expect to fail mm-hmm. and through that expect to grow yes absolutely and you you can't really have one without the other you can't have the growth that you want to see you can't create the life that you want to create without having all of the experiences that get you there and some of those experiences are going to be the struggle it's going to be the failure it is going to be like oh i tried this thing i'll use this podcast as an example hopefully anyone that's been uh, listening or, or watching has seen a sp- probably slow yet steady uh, increase in our ability to have conversations, yeah. what the, even the intro would look like, the process of editing, all of those things. Um, and that has been trial and, trial and error. There's been things where I've wasted five, six hours going through mm. something. Well, I'll, I'll use what we, you and I had text um, from the first one yeah. is the goal for this podcast is to be much more personal than it is professional. Mm-hmm. And when I was going through the editing process for the video specifically, I text Will because what I noticed is I was, as I was editing and taking out all the mess ups, all the ums, all the, the blips that I determined not, uh, that were failures and I removed them the experience became much more professional and was exactly what I didn't want it to be. And he and I had a conversation and decided, nope, it's going to be more live uh, than it would be an edited format because it it turned it into something that it wasn't. 
it yeah. didn't have the errors and uh, the struggles that that were part of that. And those are the things that make it honest and, and relatable. And and once I took those out, I'm not going to lie, I didn't like it. And, and I know there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are keeping us accountable and going, wow, these guys are really talking about ums and, you know, <laughs> so they're going to be counting. They're going to be counting how many times I say so after the end of my sentences. And they're going to be counting how many times we say um as a group, um, which we would appreciate because it's it's necessary to, to make the show better for there's especially be for an um tally. Yeah, especially for Jason, because he's going to be continuing this. And this is, uh, you know, I might be back once in a while, but you better you know, be. I, well, I hope to be, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's the accountability piece that's, it just makes things, mm-hmm. it not only does it make it, make it more personable, um, especially if you have that person to keep you accountable, like Garrett and I for the gym, or mm-hmm. um, like you just called me out on, you know, being a little bit more personable and, you know, keeping in touch <laughs> with everybody, especially when I'm feeling down and I need to just take space away, but I still need to keep up with my relationships, mm-hmm. um, which I appreciate. That's, that's the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that it wouldn't be life without these learning and doing this. So I absolutely, know. I want to touch on one last idea before yeah. uh, we head out, and that is along the terms of the emotions and feelings. But this is much more specific, and that uh-huh. is of happiness, sadness, and grief. The through these last few years, having way too much of those Mm -hmm. uh, experiences uh, and and grief specifically between the loss of my mom, uh, Tracy's dad had recently passed. And just earlier this week, we had gone uh, to another funeral. And what hit me uh, actually at all three of those um, moments in time was a lot of what we're talking about is seeing people hurt and mm-hmm. the loss of somebody is going to carry its own weight. It is, it is. there's going to be a level of difficulty and loss and, and pain that comes with that naturally. And what I have witnessed both for myself, uh, some days much better than other days, admittedly, um, but also observing others is that the, the way somebody deals with it and the amount of healing or hurt that is inflicted, mm-hmm. I have seen it largely be controlled by the individual themselves. Mm-hmm. So folks who struggle or f- hyper-focus on the loss the absence of the person, the secondary losses that come with that have struggled and their healing is prolonged substantially compared to those, whether it's acceptance or, and uh, if anyone is listening from earlier this week, I was blown away and truly had a sense of joy and love which I have never thought possible through that kind of experience based on the wife and children who were maintaining and had structured the uh, ceremony and the actual funeral process which transitioned at the end to be a ceremony of life. I've heard of it, people have talked about it, it was my first true experience and in my opinion, is what loss should be. It is this person is gone and everyone's talking about some of the sad, but the blessings, the joys, the impacts of this individual and seeing how they did that with hurt and grace, with hurt and hope, with hurt and feeling blessed all at the same time. I, ha- I was overwhelmed with a sense of pride and gratefulness and joy knowing that the the process of healing had already started and seeing that they honored this person in such a profound way the way that they wanted to be recognized and acknowledged after their passing yeah it was it was truly fucking phenomenal and And i cannot commend them enough 
was it so it was more like a celebration of life um, it was after, literally after, a the, celebration. after the funeral and and that's that's something that is is super cool to hear and and like you will i mean you're gonna point you're you'll point out and you'll talk about this a lot more in, in different things as well but everybody grieves differently oh gosh um, everybody everybody experiences that loss differently and you already started touching on it but when it comes down to it I was as soon as you said when you were talking about the whole ceremony and then you put how they wanted to be remembered mm -hmm. that's what I was going for is what were the wishes of the person who was gone mm -hmm. and how is did did what the family did after that person was gone follow up with what that person asked them to do because mm -hmm. some people don't want the recognition some people don't want a ceremony and yet the people who are grieving decide that it's their choice sure. because the person's no longer there. And that's, that's, um, yeah, that's where one of the things that I was hoping would come out in that as well, because it sounds like they did exactly what the person wanted, which was a celebration of like, don't mourn me. If you need to mourn, you, you go ahead and mourn, but yeah. I don't want my life to be, I don't want my death to be a mourning. I want it to be a celebration of the things that I did or the things mm -hmm. that I didn't do or how much of it a whole or how much of a great person I was I want you to talk about it all and just celebrate the person who I was whether it be good or bad um and I think that him setting the stage for it to be that way sets the stage for all of those living because it sets the mindset of moving forward yeah which is a pitfall uh of what you typically see at a normal process for a funeral is that it's about the hurt the pain the sadness yep. that are innately there they're, they're they are already Absolutely. there but Absolutely. that becomes the focus which sets the stage moving forward mm -hmm. it's a focus on those things but the way it was structured his wishes changed that it changed the whole dynamic to this is difficult because it, it's naturally going to be that way yeah but this is how you move forward you move forward with the blessing, the silly stories, and hearing all the laughter and the the love and the conversations that that folks were were happening, hearing the roar of the noise, because so many people were engaging in that. I, cool. I was truly, I was like, that that noise, that's love. That mm -hmm. is the sound, that is the impact that this person had left and seeing uh, the wife and kids manage that, absolutely getting emotional uh, at times, which is expected. Yeah. Absolutely. But when the, when the stage for healing is set, like I, I can only imagine how much better that will go compared to folks who get stuck in the, the, the hurt, the sadness, um, because it gets exacerbated, mm -hmm. right? So going through something difficult innately is already difficult. But if you hyper-focus on that, it becomes tenfold. It, it can feel remarkably overwhelming and impossible. Yeah. But for anyone who can, can find, and I'm going to use their word, um, the blessing in whatever that situation would be. And it's difficult at times, absolutely, absolutely. fucking difficult. Um, again, nothing that I'm saying implies ease or simplicity. No. But when we can find that, right? When we can find ways um, that our own accountability can create the life that we want, can create the moments of happiness when it's reaching out to a friend or a significant other or a colleague or joining a sport, or doing uh, a co-ed sport, right? Finding the joys, or I'm going to not throw you under the bus. This is not a bus, uh, but going to sushi. Yeah. Right. See, got you there. <laughs> the, that idea, Chick-fil-A. Oh, you were dialing into, I'm, I'm hungry right now, but uh, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> the, when we're able to key into those things, um, things are, can profoundly be better or they can pr profoundly be worse. And um, something that, that I often have said is any emotion serves a purpose. Absolutely. We have sensations, uh, for spe very specific reasons. And if we're experiencing something, uh, an emotion, a feeling, 
and we don't have the ability to use it to make it helpful. And helpful doesn't imply pleasant, right? Grief can be helpful. Sadness can be helpful. Mm -hmm. But if we can't use it to be helpful and it is not serving a purpose or the purpose is only hurtful, if we can acknowledge that and begin to do the work to change that, our lives become much better, yeah. much faster. And I, I think that's one of the things that people forget is that they get caught up in, especially when it comes to, because you were talking about celebrations, grief and, and loss, mm -hmm. um, successes and grief and loss. But we always tend to focus on those, that grief and loss part, mm -hmm. and then it sticks with us. And we find ourselves um, either because somebody isn't, uh, and like you said, you're not throwing me under the bus. I'm going to throw myself under it. Um, when I get down, when I get um, into that mood of like, I just need mm -hmm. to, I get quiet, I get separated. Um, and I don't lose track of my focus in my life. I lose track of my relationships, um, which mm -hmm. is what, what I, and I, I don't, I don't have a way yet to keep myself accountable for that, which I need to find. Um, but I think that's one of the things is that so many people just, oh, they're grieving. They're, they're sad. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. But if it's causing them to quit their job or lose their job because they're not going in or stay in bed for four weeks in a row, eating ice cream and just been watching movies. If you need a couple, if you need some time, that's fine, yep. but you need to go through the appropriate steps. Um, and it's not saying that you, you can't grieve or you can't feel that loss, but you have to make sure that it doesn't rule your entire life mm -hmm. and change you as a person. Um, because number one, that's what the, that's the last thing that the person who passed away or you lost or whatever, if it was a relationship that, um, you know, ended either amicably or not, um, that's the last thing that you need to do. And the, if it's somebody that you lost, it's the last thing that the person you lost would want you to do, you know, is to, grand, is to dad, continue father, to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Fathers, grandfathers, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, brothers, just because you lose them and they go earlier than they're supposed to, or they go when they're supposed to, you know, mm -hmm. um, depending on whom or what you believe in sure. they're they would not want you to just put their passing in front of everything else and you just stop living. And it, 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 it really begs the question of, do we really have people that are willing to call us out on that and say, Hey, you know, we love you. Where are you? What's going on? Um, luckily I have, you know, you guys, um, I have my wife, I have my, my, my mother and, and my family, the rest of my family as well, that'll do that. But it's some people don't have that person Fair enough, yeah. to, to say, Hey, get up, let's do something small to get yourself started back up. Yep. Let's get there. But, yeah, absolutely. Well, Will, I appreciate your conversation and candor as always. I hope Absolutely. that this was helpful to at least somebody who has been listening. I'm going to do a little bit of the uh, kind of closing uh, info. Yeah. So for any of those uh, who have been listening, again, our good friend, Will Squares, uh, teacher, husband, friend, uh, and all around humble badass uh, is, is what I would uh, say. It's a little bit stubborn on occasion. Again, thank you, bud, for, for joining us for today's topic. I know we kind of went all over the place, but I feel like that was pretty genuine and authentic uh, in, in our conversation um, on personal accountability. If you have not taken the opportunity to put in your vote for our next topic, of course, you can do that at j-tm.community slash podcast. Or if you have an interest in reaching out to uh, communicate with me directly or in um, different services such as Advancement Advising, again, you can do that through the website there as well. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening and being a part of a community where you belong.